Welcome to Let's Talk Wellness. It's time to have new conversations about mental health. Join Mara James as she guides us along this journey. And now, Let's Talk Wellness. Welcome to Let's Talk Wellness. I am your host, Mara James, and I want to say thank you for joining us today. These conversations are all about taking a deeper dive into understanding how we can help support children and their families to have better mental health and emotional wellness. Let's Talk Wellness is brought to you by the Extraordinary Lives Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to help improve children's mental health and emotional wellness. You can find out more information about ELF and more episodes at elfempowers.org slash podcasts. And you can find the link in the show information below. Now, let's talk wellness with today's guest, Rachel Steinmetz. Rachel is a parenting coach and a mom of four young children. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's great. So tell us about your four young children. How old are they? I have four under six. My youngest one is four months old. So I have a busy, busy household. Wow. And you look so well rested and it's so peaceful. God bless. You must have some amazing <laughs> tricks that we're excited of the trade that we're excited to hear about today. Totally. So, so how long have you been parenting coach? I started co-regulated parenting with my husband two years ago. Um, so in, a, in an official capacity, I've been doing it for two years. Beautiful. So tell us that word co-regulating. What does that mean? So co-regulating and co-regulated parenting is based around this idea that our children feed off of our energy. And if we come at them stressed, dysregulated, and we're not taking care of ourselves, then we are co-dysregulating our children. And we're actually making them have more big feelings because they're feeding off of us. So we use our calm, we use our balance and peace to co-regulate our tiny humans so that we can live that symbiotic relationship together. Tiny humans, I love that. So where were you about 20 years ago when I was <laughs> when I had my first, gosh, if I only knew then what I've learned now. Um, that is amazing. And you said that you do this work with your husband? Yes, we started this together. We've been doing this together in workshops, one-on-one -on -one with parents together, um, because I really feel like if you have the blessing of having a co-parent, if you have a partner that's willing to do this work with you, it makes it so much easier. That's why I can be so rested with you today because of him. Right. Oh, that's amazing. So what, let's talk about those of our lovely husbands that aren't so um, on the same page as us, right? What, what like, obviously it's the hardest thing. Um, what do you recommend when that happens? That's where my husband and I, um, their husbands have one-on-ones. And that's where I think having the benefit of us doing it together is really beneficial because he can sit down with them and kind of have that one-on-one -on -one conversation that's like, hey, what are you doing? You signed up for these kids. You signed up for this. Let's talk about, of course, psychology and child development and all the norms, but also have that, you know, guy to guy conversation about like, why are you not stepping up? for your partner? What's that missing link so that they can still get what they need from you? Wow. Brilliant. So how um, do men <laughs> have more of an ego, EGO, edging God out than women? Um, and how, what are his interactions? Does he find a lot of, or most of the um, fathers are open to um, his words? Yeah. His so I've done classes where I've worked with both parents, both the moms and the dads at the same time. And we found that they're much more receptive to him than they are to me coaching them. And that's fine, right? That's why we got into this business together. But they're able to have these vulnerable conversations in maybe a ways that don't seem vulnerable to women and to us because we're so used to having those in one way, but he's still able to have those in their own way. And they're so receptive to it because it's coming from him. Yeah, the, I mean, this is just brilliant that the two of you working together um, is profound. So let's dive into some great things. Um, tell us, like, do you work with um, virtually? Do you work in person? What does um, a class look like with you? 
both. So I love doing virtual sessions. I think after 2020, everything became virtual and thank goodness for that because it's opened up so many doors. So I've been lucky enough to work with people all over the US. I've worked with people in different countries virtually, um, but we also have been doing some incredible workshops in person where we've partnered with local centers that help parents out and we've used their space and we've used their classes and come in and taught the parents at that location. So all around Orange County and then also virtually. That is amazing. Do you limit the size of your classes, either virtually or in person? Yeah, in, in virtually and in person, we try to do 10 um, capacity because we find that any more than that, and there's really just not enough time to get really deep into it. Because I don't want to just go into a class and just talk at you for two hours. That's not conducive to actual learning. I want us to be having conversations and I want you to be having conversations with the other parents in the group because we thrive on community and we're in, when we're in that community, when we're in that space where we can talk and learn from each other, I think that's when we do the best healing. Beautiful. And is there an age range of the children um, and the parents that you support? Yeah. So I like to start when mamas are pregnant prenatally, because I think if we can really figure out not how difficult things are going to be, because, you know, life is difficult in so many different ways. But if we can really figure out what our goals and our intentions are as parents, if we can set our wish lists, if we can start working on that regulation and that dysregulation that comes with parenthood, when you become a parent and it unlocks things that you never even knew existed until you're holding that crying baby in your arms. If we can really get into that while you're pregnant, I think it makes it so much easier by the time you're in those big, loud feeling moments. And then we go all the way until the teen years. My husband really is really excellent with older kiddos and I specialize more in um, prenatal to age seven. Beautiful. What a great combination. Um, it's interesting, you know, my husband's an OBGYN. When I was managing his office, we'd have all these women come in with their birthing plans. And I um, wanted to laugh and be like, you think you're in control, just, you know, so I don't know if you ever work with that and having them like, you know, what their ideal delivery might look like, but also being open to that. They're not in control and they have to have some faith in the universe. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's so, I, I went into a circle that was doing mindfulness and meditation and hypnobirthing for moms. And I got to speak to them about parenting, which I mean, worked perfectly because when we're pregnant, everybody is telling us this, this is how you should do this. This is how you should feel. This is how your birth should look. And they don't stop once the baby's there. Once your baby's there, they're like, no, you should teach them this way. You should parent like this. You should discipline this way. It never stops. So comparing those two, right, and saying you're not actually as in control as you think you are, because there's going to be all of those outside noise coming in. And also your kids, your baby, it's its own person, it's going to choose its own path, both from birth on, right, we don't have as much control as we think we do. So relinquishing that control in pregnancy helps you so much throughout parenthood because then you don't feel like you have to control everything with every little thing that comes up in parenthood too. Amazing. It's unbelievable. And I look back how naive I was. I didn't realize I was bringing like a person or a soul. I thought this was my child and I'm in charge and oh my goodness, like, wait, these children have their own life path, their own soul, their own journey. And we're just here to guide it. And it, it's been such a revelation. And of course, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I wonder how things would have been differently. I mean, you know, my number one, as long as you could just love your children unconditionally, even during the rough patches, that's the most important thing. Totally. Right? Love, love is number one, right? Because we're all going to mess, even if we know all of this information, we're going to mess up. It's human. Yeah. It's human yeah. to mess up. Yeah. But I think knowing what you want, setting those intentions, knowing that it's okay to apologize and make those mistakes and that you're not going to be perfect makes it so much easier when you've yelled, when you've done something wrong, and then you need to go back and really recover that relationship with your child, no matter the age that they are. Yeah. And also releasing guilt. That's a big one. What parent, okay. what mom doesn't feel guilt? I mean, hopefully not daily, but seriously, <laughs> there's just so much. I mean, I, you know, we could eat ourselves alive thinking about it. Yeah. And I think teaching something that's important to me is teaching that your relationship isn't that vulnerable, right? If you've established these pillars, 
within your relationship from birth, if you've always apologized, even when you've messed up, if you've put love first, if you've put connection over correction first, then you can mess up and it's not going to ruin your relationship for the rest of your lives. Okay. This is profound. So I'm going to put myself <laughs> out there because I, my youngest, my the love of my life, my daughter um, was doing a, pri- she's a healer and she was doing a private session for me and a newer friend. And afterwards, my daughter's like, mom, you really triggered me. And I was like, it's done. She hates me. Our relationship is over. Like what was making, so like psychoanalyze, like what was making me thinking like this was the end of it, you know, and now she's away on a trip and just like, mom, I miss you so much. And I'm like, oh my goodness, obviously this is my um, Michigas, but. Yeah. And we, I mean, so much of our reaction if not all of our reaction is based off of how we were treated as children, how we grew up into this world, how we were treated by society as we grew up. So it's not our children's behaviors that are triggering us, right? They're just that tiny little light switch that reminds our brain of every single thing that happened when we were little. And it's, that's what awakens us, right? Our childhood is what gets us (laughs) at the end of the day. Oh my God, I'm having a big aha moment. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's so true. Right. Like what happened with my parents that if I didn't do what they wanted or said, it was, it was cut off. That was it. Yep. Wow. And of course, as a child, when they're your lifeline, it's that much more, gosh, these children for better, they're really little mirrors reflecting a hundred percent on a daily basis, but what we need to, or get to heal. Unbelievable. So tell us, what is um, what was your training and why did you decide to go into this amazing field of parenting, which we all could use because nobody comes with um, you know, a rule book? Totally. My training began when I gave birth to my first. I held this tiny little baby in my hands and I said, I have to do better. I have to be the best human that I possibly can be, the best version of myself, so that they grew up with the least amount of capital T trauma possible, right? Because immediately I started playing, like I'm holding this baby and I'm playing everything that went wrong in my childhood in my head while I'm sitting there in the hospital. So I'm like, how do I prevent this? So I actually got um, postpartum doula certified because I was so passionate about, you know, taking care of babies right from the womb. Then I went in and studied early childhood development and early childhood education. And then I got my parenting coaching certification and I made sure to focus it on trauma informed care because I know how sensitive it is for me thinking about my childhood. So when I'm working with parents, I never want to overstep in a way that could cause more damage. We're trying to heal. Um, So it's been a journey for the last six years of my life. And it's truly, it's truly been such an honor to be a part of so many people's families in this way. Wow. And it's great that we just need so much of this. It's beautiful um, that you're doing that. And you worked with, um, there's a mommy center in Mission Viejo. Yeah, the Mommy Center, right? Mission VA is called the Mommy Center. Um, Center. They have parent and me classes for moms. As soon as baby's born, you go, you find your circle, you find your community. Um, And I've been a guest speaker there where I've talked about parenting. And then we've also hosted our co-regulated parenting shops there also. Right. So that's amazing. And so now that you have four young children, are they all like perfectly behaved with the two of you as these amazing mindful parents? Oh my goodness. No, because they're kids, right? I call them tiny humans because I think when we think of them as kids, they sometimes get misconstrued as property, right? Like that's my kid, but it's not. A tiny human is just a smaller version of a fully formed being. I always like to say that they're not going to become something. They already are. And we need to respect them as this human being that they already are in front of us. Um, And so, no, my kids are kids. They're humans. They have feelings. They have reactions to things. But I will say that the cool down period, the way that we can go in there with them, We utilize a method that we call the closed caption method my husband and I created, and we're able to bounce back in a significantly faster way and really hold space for those feelings. But with this parenting method, my goal, my husband's goal is never to eliminate feelings. My goal is never to eliminate behaviors. It's to figure out how to grow together with your tiny human. 
That's amazing. I want to talk about this closed caption toolbox in a few, but first, so your children are still young. Um, so I hear that they're tiny humans, but when they get old, when one, you know, the oldest one gets to be in middle school and God forbid he's being bullied because I went through that with my middle gifted and challenging one. And it broke my heart. I wanted to go, you know, pounce on the parents, which was in, you know, um, I didn't, but it was like heartbreaking to me. So how do you, or, you know, how would you suggest like we kind of separate what our children are going through emotionally with our emotions? Because they're That's such a part of our heart, right? They're such a part of our heart, but it's our job not to put our feelings onto them. And that starts with toddlerhood. Right. So you, when we teach you how to communicate effectively with your kids, you are not going to say, I'm so mad at you. You made mommy so mad. Right. And in that same regard, when they're older and they are experiencing these big, profound moments in their life, bullying is a huge, profound, changing moment in their life. It is not about you. So it doesn't matter what your feelings are in that moment. You have your spouse to talk about those feelings with. You have a therapist to talk about your feelings with. It is not our job to put our emotional weight onto our kid. We're just that safe space for them. So as soon as we can distinguish that, right? Like I go to someone else with my feelings, my kid goes to me. That is when we can separate that. Does that make sense? It's, yes. And it's so important, especially when I, you know, we see couples and friends that are getting divorced and how they think that their child's their best friend and they talk negatively about the, you know, the future ex-spouse and it just, it, it breaks my heart. It, they don't realize how they're hurting their child. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. And luckily I never spoke to my son about it, but it's interesting. He's 25 and I still noticed I was projecting emotions. So the other day I was going through something and I, there's this go around technique that I, I learned how to do. It's a healing technique. And I started doing it on myself. It helps us process anger, fear, and sadness through our bodies. And I realized, oh my goodness, I was projecting my emotions on him and I could ask him how he feels about it, but don't project and don't worry about it. And I think that's the biggest thing. And also like, you know, as an empathic parent, like literally feeling their emotions. Oof, it's, it's, it's harder, right? My husband is an empath, like full, clear, diagnosed empath. Um, so it's really hard when we had to really master that pause, right? The pause is one of the most important ways that we can interact with our children because if we can pause before we react, before we explode, before we show them our emotions about their situations, then anything is possible if we can master that pause. Let's talk about the pause. <laughs> I don't know if this is part of the tool packs or not. It is. It is. Okay. But I just need to hear about it because, you know, it's, you know, it's always like if you're about to give your child a five second timeout, give yourself the timeout. So yeah. If yeah. You can talk about that pause. Oh my goodness. Where to even start? So the it is part of the closed caption method. And so it's the first step. The first step is to be regulated within yourself so that you do not react before you've thought about it. So what we have that our children don't have fully and like it doesn't even activate till they're eight years old is the prefrontal cortex. And it doesn't even stop growing in their brains until they used to say 25. New research is saying towards 28 years old. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but we, as the parent and the adult, and really depending on what age we've had the child, right, is our prefrontal cortex is at least much more developed than their prefrontal cortex. So we have the ability to have impulse control and stop ourselves before we react to something. But in order to do that pause, we need to be taking care of ourselves too. So that means getting enough sleep, getting enough water, eating enough, having enough self-care. And I'm not talking about girls' nights every night or nails. Self-care, I really, really just mean like time away from your children doing literally anything for yourself. It doesn't have to be fancy or extravagant. But if we're taking care of ourselves, if we are regulated, then we can pause before we react. If we are not taking care of ourselves, you know, they say filling your cup, um, putting your air, own air mask on before putting on their air mask. If we're not doing that, pausing is not going to happen. It won't be available to your body, to your system, because <laughs> you are so triggered by being hungry, by being tired, 
by all of these other things that you will not be able to stop yourself before you react to these situations. The pause. Wow. And so for parents that have gone through, right, I believe we all go through trauma, big T's, little T's. So for some of us that have gone through bigger ones, do you find it harder? I mean, does it make sense that it'd be harder for that parent to pause? Uh -huh. Because like for me, I was in undiagnosed anxiety and PTSD going running. Blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. A hundred percent. And that's why the healing part of that co-regulation is so important right? And healing will look different for everybody. I love this idea of holistic healing, right? You have to do whatever works for you, but you have to find something that works, right? Some people find it through their faith. Some people find it through something, hobbies that they enjoy doing. Some people find it through other human beings, through therapy. You just, medications, like there's no limit to what works for you, but you have to figure out how to heal that part of yourself because then otherwise, all of these things that you're finding on social media, all those books that you're reading, any advice that you're getting from anywhere, it's not going to work because you are not taking care of you. I love that. And it's amazing how many clients I've worked with that are they're like, oh, my parents great. My childhood was great. And they and, and, you know, again, my subconscious also protected me for 52 years. I have no idea about my huge childhood trauma. And it's just amazing um, that. Yeah right? That we don't even realize all of that. Um, we are going to take a brief break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about the closed caption toolbox. So hold on one moment. We hope that you're enjoying today's Let's Talk Wellness podcast. And if you have a topic that you would like us to explore, we would love to hear from you. Simply email us at info at elfempowers.org. That's info at elfempowers.org. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to Let's Talk Wellness. I am your host, Mara James, and today we are speaking with Rachel Steinmetz. Welcome back, Rachel. Yay. Loving this conversation. Oh, so much fun. We could speak for days. I know. <laughs> um, and, and, and just to help bring like helping parents that just don't know, you know. Um, so let's discuss the closed caption toolbox. We started going over the first part of it, you said. Yes. So yeah. So the whole closed caption method um, is a really an homage to my husband and I's date nights, right? We love sitting in the dark, watching TV quietly so the kids don't hear with the closed captions on. So when we were naming this method, we thought, what if we could turn the closed captions on with our interactions with our children? Like, what if there were little subtitles being like crying, whimpering, sadness that told us why our children were behaving the way that they were behaving. So that's why we named it the closed caption method. Wait, do you have an answer for this? Like, you know, like, why are they crying? Wow. <laughs> kind of, kind of. That's kind of the purpose of the method. So if we master the pause, right, we've taken care of ourselves, we've mastered the pause. The second step after that is going to be rewinding. And you can have to sometimes have to rewind up to a year to figure out what could be triggering your kid in this moment. So there are things like a new sibling being born, a big move, a new school, any big change that cannot affect your kid for up to a year after it's happened, right? Wow. So a new baby's born and we're like, wow, they get along so great. I don't know what people were warning me about. They love each other, blah, 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 blah. And then nine months later, suddenly big is having these big, loud feelings. They're kicking, screaming, biting, doing things that they've never done before. And the parent is like, I have no idea what's happening. And I'm like, well, what changes have happened in the last year? And the parent is like, year? And I'm like, yes, because the big changes sometimes take so long to process because that prefrontal cortex is still developing. Our brains are still growing. They don't really understand what's going on. So we are taking up to a year to see what changes have occurred. And sometimes, you know, it's just they have, they missed their meal time, right? We missed their window of like happy meal time by 30 minutes. And it doesn't have to be this huge, big change. And so now they want the green cup instead of the blue cup. And they're sitting on the floor crying and screaming about it. And to an adult lens, we're like, why is it such a big deal? Why I just, just take whatever cup you're going to take. But the kid who's missed their hungry window, they're now overly hungry because it's later than it normally is. Maybe they didn't get to pick one out that they were going to wear today because you were rushing off to school. Maybe last night we only got to read three stories instead of two stories. They feel so out of control with everything going on that now this blue cup versus green cup is the only thing they feel like they have control over. So now you've rewound. You've figured out what could possibly be triggering your kid. 
and why these feelings are exploding right now in this moment. You have to decide, am I gonna die on this hill? Do I really care that much about switching the juice from the green cup to the blue cup? Like, am I like, do I really like, is this going to change my child's future if I pour the juice back into another cup? Or am I going to sit there and say, no, you're going to drink from this cup. And if you are deciding that you're going to stick with the cup you gave them, why are you sticking with that cup? And if you have decided that you have to then be okay with the fact that they're going to sit there crying for however long they're going to cry because they're allowed to be upset about it. So that's our rewind. And then we're going to push, play, resume back on the situation and play it out. And sometimes because they've been crying for a really, really long period of time, they need a bridge. So that's when we rewind or fast forward the situation a little bit. So sometimes they need a bridge through their behavior is because they're just so overstimulated. They've been crying for so long. You've been yelling at them because you're dysregulated. Now you're both dysregulating each other. So you just have to not let them sit in this feeling because it's been like 30 minutes of crying nonstop. You're starting to cry. Everything, the baby needs to go take a nap, right? There's so many things that happen. So we're going to rewind or fast forward the situation by doing a few different activities. Pausing and doing a dance break, asking Alexa to put on Baby Shark, our favorite song, and just starting to dance even when we don't, even when we're so, and we're so mad. We're like, no, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to break this tension and I'm just going to turn on baby shark and start making a joke or I'm going to drop to my knees depending how much energy we have that day and I'm going to pretend to be a tiger and I'm just going to race my kid to get their teeth brushed because they've been saying on the floor saying I'm not going to brush my teeth I'm not going to brush my teeth and I'm going to race them to the bathroom and obviously we're going to let them win yeah. and that is how we kind of fast forward through those big feelings because we've just been in them for so long that it feels like we're not going to get out of them. So those are kind of like, you know, if you're picturing your little remote and all of those little button options to get through a movie. And that is how we're going to think of our interactions with our children. And this again can only happen if we are taking care of ourselves because otherwise who has the patience for any of this? Oh, do as I say, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. you know, when you're talking about this, like I keep hearing in my head, um, you know, well, if I let them have the cup that they want, then they are going to be spoiled. And there's like all these stories in the head, which isn't the case. Like with my son, um, now 25, but, you know, on the spectrum, ADHD, I just knew like if he had pancake and eggs on pancakes and eggs on the same plate and the syrup from the pancakes got on the eggs, he would not touch any of it. And, you know, a lot of parents would be like, you're going to eat that and da, 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 da. Whereas like, no, like their brains cannot handle that and um, have, you know, and learning. But it's so much work, as you said, like for the parents. It is so much work because we've been taught either in our childhood or by all this outside noise or our in-laws telling us this is wrong or our next door neighbor coming over and being like, where are your kids socks? Right. Everybody's always telling us about something. And we really need to learn to tune out that noise, right? We just have to focus on our relationship with our kid. Because at the end of the day, your mother-in-law and you are not the ones that are, you know, spending the next 50 years of your lives together. It's you and your kid, right? Mm -hmm. It's you and your child's relationship that matters at the end of the day. It truly, true, like your mother-in-law, your grandmother, your neighbor, they're not your kid's parents. You are their parent. You get the final say and who cares what they think, truly. And I know that's a really hard thing to overcome for some, but at the end of the day, your kids' feelings have to matter more than your parents' feelings or your in-laws' feelings. I love that. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so where are we now with the closed caption toolbox? So we have all these methods, right? We know the steps that we're going to do. And now we have to kind of develop what we call is like the streaming. And when we're streaming, that's when we pull in our network, our resources. And that's where we have to sometimes call for help. Because if you are so dysregulated because you haven't eaten, you haven't slept, you have a newborn baby who has time for sleeping and eating when you're nursing or feeding or changing diapers all the time, right? You need to need to have a support system. And that support system doesn't have to be your partner, right? Because sometimes as much as I can work with the partner, as much as my husband works with a the partner, they are just not interested in learning about the psychology or the, it's just, and that's okay, right? But that's why paid help exists. That's why sometimes a parent who's willing to learn these things 
exists. And I've sat with grandparents and talked about this method and about child psychology and child development instead. You can have, I mean, if you have a neighbor, anybody that is willing to be that person for you and your child in the situation, and they're willing to join you in kind of this radical way of parenting by not caring what other people say and prioritizing your relationship with your kid before everything else, call on them for help. Be, and if you can't, if you are all alone and it's the middle of the night and you're alone with your kids and nobody's going to help you and you just feel so dysregulated, you're going to put your remote down. You're going to forget all of these steps. You're going to close yourself in the bathroom. You're going to cry. You're going to scream. You know that your kid is safe in whatever house you've made because it's baby proofed and whatever you've done to prepare for your kid. And you're going to let yourself have a moment in the bathroom, in the closet by yourself you're not going to worry about the tools. You're not going to worry about child psychology. You need to take care of yourself in that moment so that you can come back to your kid and repair. And you're going to forget every single thing I just taught you about pausing and rewinding and changing because all of that right now doesn't matter. You're going to sit on the floor with your kids so you're eye level with them because if you're eye level, you can solve almost anything in the world. And you're going to say, mommy's having a really hard day. We're not communicating right now. We just need to figure out how to be a team again. And even if they're babies, right? Even if they're one years old and cannot talk to you, they're not really fully comprehending what you're saying. They can understand the emotion and the intent and the kindness and love that you're showing them by standing on the floor or sitting on the floor and just having that heart to heart with them. And you're just going to be there. And I love that you said we're a team. Yes. That is so beautiful. And you reminded me of somebody who I spoke to that, I, I don't know what was a doula, but teaching that the mother and the child, like they're a team starting when the baby's in the belly, like we're a team and we're going to do this, like even from the delivery. And then yeah. Yeah. that is so beautiful and God willing, a team for life, right? Everything's yeah. hunky dory and in the life forever. Um, Wow. That team philosophy is profound. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And as they get older, you just cooperate with them, right? They'll be able to vocalize things and share their ideas. And I see a lot of advice saying, give your kid choices, but like limit it to two. And that can work when they're little, but by the time they're four or five, that doesn't work anymore. Those like choose the blue shirt or the green shirt. Cause then they're like, no, I want the purple shirt. You have to actually carve out time and space in your life for your children's choices right? You have to plan to be late to things, be okay with being late to things, make more time for yourself than necessary. So you're not rushing out the door because they deserve the time to actually make choices. And you sit down with them and you're saying, Hey, tomorrow we have a really busy day. I need us to be a team. We need to work together because they're older now, right? How can we avoid this? How can we do that? And that doesn't mean that it's going to prevent all those feelings from happening the next day when suddenly everything is chaos and we're rushing but you've talked to them about it. So in the back of their mind, in their hearts, right, you've connected on this situation already. So even though you're having chaos the next day, you've already connected. You've already set these expectations for one another. And it's them setting expectations for us too, right? I need you to not yell at me so much. And that's a fair thing for them to say, right? As they get older, and they're having issues in school. How do you want me to handle that? Do you want to just vent to me about the stuff that you're coming to me with at school? Or do you need me to intervene? And as they get even older and they're in their teen years, which are back in their like two-year-old, three-year-old phases, right? Because their prefrontal cortex is there now, but their id and is taking over and they just want everything that they can get their hands on. It's biological. It's biological and understanding but they're not trying to manipulate manipulate you because they're malicious. It's just a biological, psychological need for them to have control over their lives. Oh, that's amazing. Just knowing like, you know, when we're not thinking that they're trying to control us because that's a whole nother set of issues. Um, beautiful. Wow. Um, what, is there any different or special advice you would have for a single parent? Single parents have, I mean, my hat's off to them. I feel like my shoes are off to them. Like how much more, how much more could I be in awe of single parents truly? But I, the advice is really finding 
anybody to help you if that's not obviously a partner. But if you have a best girlfriend that's going to be coming over to clean your house without judgment for you on the weekend because you've just been working and taking care of your kids and the house is a mess and you need a shower, you need to find that person that you, you are such so close with, whether it's in a mommy group or just a childhood friend or a neighbor that you befriend that's willing to show up for you. It is all about that community and that networking you want somebody that's going to be non-judgmental, that's going to actually help around the house, right? Because we all get those people that like come over and they're like, cook for me, clean for me. That's not helping us with the baby or the kids. You need someone that's actually going to help you so that you can fill your cup, so that you can regulate yourself, so you can show up to be the best parent for your kids. And it's going to be hard. And it, I think, just re-emphasizes how much of a team you and your kid have to be because you're the true team in that relationship. I love that. I'm just thinking like, how great would it be to have like a high school, a college class talking about parenting and about regulating and let's start now. So later on when you're, you know, if and when you're going to have a family, wouldn't that be just amazing versus, okay, here we go. Let's make sure you read, write and get ready for this exam. And this (laughs) is like real life stuff that is profound. I know, but it it impacts our relationships with everyone, right? It's not just our parenting relationships. This is how we treat our relationships with everyone, coworkers, our boss. I frequently talk about how I'm, you know, co-regulating, closed captioning my neighbors because they're upset about something. Like any interaction I have with a human being, I have to see where they're coming from. Could they possibly, you know, be hangry in this moment? And that's why they're coming at me like this. Could they possibly have childhood trauma that's impacting how they're speaking to me in this moment? Every interaction I have with a human, I'm trying to think about what could be causing them to like speak to me the way that they are in that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like what Oprah always says, like, not why are you acting that way, but like what happened to you? What happened to you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to not take, this is the easiest statement, one of the hardest, but most beautiful things to do, like to not take things personally. Yeah. Right? Look, I mean, as little kids in this trauma, we, we internalize everything. But now as older, you know, when things are happening, we take things so personally and it, it's profound to be able to change that and to see it. Yeah. And in our household, there's no such thing as bad guys. Right. So we read stories and they're they're not bad characters. They're not villains. They're not evil we immediately jump into what happened to them when they were kids. And I'm talking about this with my toddlers. What happened to them when they were kids? That's making them do these things when they're grownups. What do you think they needed from their mommies and daddies or their guardians so that they didn't turn into this? Yeah. Amazing. I believe everybody, even though the worst of them out there were just born, you know, God's bright light. And then there was trauma that occurred that just made them the way they were. So amazing. Um, Rachel, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? I have a website called coregulatedparenting.com. And then the same coregulated parenting um, is my Instagram for social media. There's, you know, tips and quotes and all of those things on there too. I'm chronically online and happy to help. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Well, thank you on behalf of just the community and the world for all the work that you and your hubby are doing. Um, We will list your contact information in the show link um, information. And I just want to say that to you and everyone watching and listening, you are amazing. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk Wellness. This podcast has been brought to you by the Extraordinary Lives Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. If you would like to listen to more conversations like this, we invite you to subscribe to our mailing list at www.elfempowers.org to be notified when our episodes are published. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to bringing you our next conversation on Let's Talk Wellness.